Hello ladies and gents, I am Kundi Shagak, your peer tutor, and today I am very excited to reach out to you to contribute to the expansion of academic thought. Within this material moment in which the world finds itself, without wasting my time, let's get into the business of the day. So today, in modern Western political thought, we will be looking at our first constructionist, that is Thomas Hobbes, and this will be the structure of this tutorial. So one, we will look at the introduction to Thomas Hobbes. So we will introduce Thomas Hobbes to you, and we will look at a brief story of Thomas Hobbes, what influenced Thomas Hobbes' political philosophy, and we will look at how Thomas Hobbes paints human nature, so we'll look at the human nature. Then we'll now draw toward the state of nature as defined by Thomas Hobbes in his thesis, The Libyan Time. Then we'll look at natural laws as defined by Thomas Hobbes himself, in which some people say is a direct contradiction of his whole thesis. We'll come to look at that and we'll look at the social contract itself. What makes Hobbes a contractualist? And we'll finally what conclude on the Leviathan state and the sovereign power. And we'll look at the concluding remarks with all that we've said. With that being said, let's move into the introduction. So Thomas Hobbes was an English philosopher. He is mostly remembered today for his work on political philosophy. His 19 his 1651 book named the Leviathan established the foundation for most Western political philosophy from the perspective of the social contract theory. The English philosopher, that's Thomas Hobbes, is best known for his th political thoughts and deservedly so. His vision of the world is deservedly original and so relevant to contemporary politics. The main concern of Hobbes was the problem of social and political order. How human beings can live in peace and avoid the danger and fear of civil conflict. He contributes alternatives to the state of nature or the civil conflict as, as we've mentioned. And he said, we should give our obedience to an unaccountable un un sovereign. That's a person or a group of people empowered to decide every social and political issue. Otherwise, what awaits us is a state of nature. And that closely re resembles civil war. And the situation of universal insecurity. Where all, have, where all have risen to fear violent death and where rewarding human cooperation is all but what impossible. And such impossibility brings about the fear of death and not the fear of, as some of us will say, coronavirus. So Hobbes is the founding father of modern political philosophy. And by extension, he has set the terms of the debate about the fundamentals of political life right into our own times. So some people have liked his thesis, while others not. But the problems of political life mean that society should accept an unaccountable sovereign as its sole political authority. You would agree with me that most people ordinarily would like to flout directives of the chief executive of their various countries as I am speaking in the Ghanaian perspective amidst all the deadly coronavirus pandemic on the rise in the whole universe. So nonetheless, we still live in a world that helps address head on. That's a world where human authority is something that requires justification. 
and that justification resulted automatically into acceptability and not acceptability of all and it creates a world where social and political inequality also appears questionable after we've um, we've rendered such power to an individual for sovereign and it creates another world where religious and religious authority faces significant disputes so we live in a world where all human beings are supposed to have rights that is moral claims that protects their basic interest so permit me to ask what or who determines that which is right and who enforces what is right in other words who exercise the most important political powers when the basic assumption is that we all share the same entitlements by the end of this video ladies and gentlemen Hobbes will clarify all these questions in his own way in his Leviathan. With that being said, let's move on into the brief life story of Thomas Hobbes. So the period in which Thomas Hobbes lived influenced his political thesis. Like most medieval political thinkers who lived within the Peloponnesian War with the likes of Socrates, such happenings influence how they approached their whole philosophers philosophers so Hobbes was born on april 5 1588 he was the second son and it's interesting to note that he was born premature and he was in a family who were relatively poor so what stressed Hobbes was on fear and self-interest as the as the two fundamental human motivations needed to be tempered and controlled by an omnipotent sovereign power the presence of a sovereign separated a state of nature from a political society using the device of social contract Hobbes explained the nature of sovereignty its location the relationship with the individual that's the relationship between sovereignty and the individual and the essentials of a government why is it important for us to have a government and the origins of states so by what means did states come about did it happen spontaneously did it happen as some medieval political thinkers will say it started from a, an atomic of two spouses into a family into a community into a town then we had a country or a state so by that Hobbes defended a case of absolute legal sovereignty because absolute power ensured complete order so conversely in the absence of such absolute power the result that one should expect is chaos according to Hobbes so Hobbes identified that the English political system was not functioning smoothly as it ought to be and he was worried about the consequences of disorder and civil war in the future the troubles that Hobbes perceived finally arrived in, during the 19, uh, the 1640s and lasting for the next 20 years in addition to the 1640 age. It was during this period that Engli England experienced, experienced a tussle between royal and parliamentary forces which escalated into the execution of Charles I in 1649 and it subsequently led English, England into the Puritan rule of Cromwell. So one might ask who was Cromwell 
and who were the Puritans. So Cromwell was an English general and a statesman who led the Parliament of England against King Charles. So the issue about an absolute ruler. So the English monarch wanted to say they are they are the super head or they are the superpowers. And the English Parliament also wanted to portray him. So it led into an English civil war, which led to the execution of Charles the First. And Cromwell took over in sixteen fifty-three and till his death in sixteen fifty-eight. And the Puritans are Protestants or English Protestants who wanted or who had the ideology that they wanted to purify the English political system and religious system from the corruption of the Catholic Church. So the era of um, the Puritan rule came to an end when finally Charles II was restored. So out of that, there were three basically different of lapping struggles involved in England. So one they had parliament against the king, that's the monarch itself, the monarchical system itself. Two they had Puritans against the established church. And three the expanding economic forces of the towns and ports and countryside against the ossified old royal monopolists and landowners. So all these unfolding issues within this period had in a fundamental ideological shift. Increasingly, the community was seen as an artifact created voluntarily through a contract based on mutual agreement for the fulfillment of individual aims and aspirations. This then meant that political authority could be judged evaluated and changed for it was bound by a constitution which was saturated with laws and no longer an absolutist rule or nature the constitutional state was emerging within this time as a new political formation and it was a subject of political theorizing Hobbes was the first to grapple with this new entity which was coming up. Now let's look at the human nature. This is to explain how Hobbes views innateness of humans. So to you, are humans innately good? Are humans innately corrupt? Is the society responsible for the negative behavior reflected by fellow humans? How you answer this question will directly tell whether you agree or not with Hobbes. So Hobbes, like Machiavelli, was concerned with the secular origins of human conduct, for he did not theorize about proper behavior from an understanding of the idea of God, as some medieval political thinkers would be, will say, or from a revelation of divine commands. Invariance, this invariance to Aristotle and some other medieval political thinkers who saw human nature as innately social. Hobbes then, Hobbes, Hobbes rather viewed human beings as isolated, egoistic, self-interested, and self-seeking as a means towards serving their own ends. According to him, individuals were creatures of desire seeking pleasure and avoiding pain to him naturally pleasures were good and pain bad that was why men should pursue and maximize their pleasures and avoid pain the pleasure pain theory was later developed in a coherent and systematic theory by behaviorists or 
utilitarians like the likes of Bentham and the rest. In addition to being as the, in addition to human nature being the creature of pleasure and pain, Hobbes saw individuals constantly in motion to satisfy their desires. He then noted that continual success in the attainment and fulfillment of their desires was called a felicity. And the felicity then meant that a condition of movement and not rest. Appetites were insatiable for the satisfaction of some gave rise to others. Satisfaction therefore was a temporary feeling for individuals were aware of the recurrence of desires. Not only did individuals ensure the means for present satisfaction, but they also provided for future ones. Hobbes then asserted that every human action, feeling and thought was ultimately and physically determined because some action that one takes are sometimes spontaneous beyond resistance. Despite that, he allowed ample scope for voluntary self-designed and administrated changes in human conditions that is the condition of man determines his appetitive satisfaction i don't think the things you used to love makes use or makes meaning to you now again sometimes you can think of some actions you took some years and realize you have Excuse me to say, you have been fooling yourself or you've been stupid. So though the human being was dependent on his life in the motion of his body, he was able to some extent to control these motions and make his life. This he did by natural means, by relying partly on natural passions and partly on reason. According to Hobbes, it was reason which distinguished or differentiated humans from animals. He drew the distinction between prudence, which was an accumulation of experience, and he equated reason essentially in mathematical terms. Reason therefore enabled the individual to understand the impressions that sense organs picked up from the external world and he also indicated an awareness of one's natural passions. Hobbes also introduced interestingly the need for an arbitrator or a judge who resolved rational disagreements since no individual's reason was necessarily right. So parties to a dispute needed an arbitrator to whose sentence they will both stand. This remained a major theme in the entire political and theoretical construct of Hobbes. That order was absolutely necessary and that it was an indispensable condition for getting anywhere with human reason. Of being able to build any sort of culture Despite the gloomy nature painted by Hobbes, he did not exclude the possibility of altruism, listing benevolence, goodwill, and charity as part of passions of individuals. Good and evil were names that signified an individual's appetites and aversions. The objects of an the objective of an individual's desire or desires varied in accordance with his personal characteristics. But all in all, at least ordinarily, he desired self-preservation. Peace enhanced the possibility of preserving ourselves, so it was good and it was necessary, but it wasn't the case. 
So let me quickly add that. You should know that the need for an arbitrator was not due to the lack of reason itself. The more compelling factor was that there was a kind of barrier or barricade erected between human beings as a result of their natural passions. So your natural passion of living as an individual and the natural passion of the other individual having the right to also live. So who will sacrifice the other for the other to live? And these passions were directly related to individuals valuing their lives above everything else and sticking to it at all costs. The appetites and aversions were basically passions. The feeling towards things depended on how conducive they were in ensuring and maintaining life and was accordingly or described as good or bad. The aim of the individual dictated the passions to obtain the desired results. It is important to also take note that human will in Hobbes philosophy did not imply anything spiritual, rational or transcendental as some medieval political thinkers put it, but it was related to the natural needs of the body, the body itself. He mentioned a long list of passions, but the special emphasis was on fear, in particular fear of death, and on the universal and perfectly justified quest for power. In contrast to classical philosophers, Hobbes did not assign any positive or higher aim to life, maybe a utopia, a small bonum, or the greatest good. He didn't make any mention of that in his uh, philosophical theorizing. So to come clear, since individuals would like to do their own thing, pursue their own desires, there was the ultimate human good as a criterion or the measure of ethical judgment itself. Hobbes therefore contended that life was not but a perpetual and relentless desire and pursuit of power and a prerequisite of felicity. He pointed out that one ought to recognize, and I quote, general, the general inclination of all mankind, a perpetual and a restless desire for power after power, that only in death. So consequently, individuals were prone to death, especially accidental death, for it marked the end of the attainment of all felicity. Power was suit, for it represented a means of acquiring those things that made life worthwhile, in which he called the felicity. The very fact that all individuals suit power in this regard distinguished Hobbes from Machiavelli because all individuals are seeking power. And it's a significant facet of Hobbes' perception that So Hobbes' political philosophy also introduced equality of all men. The fact that men were equal in physical power and faculties of the mind. So that distinguished significantly Hobbes' theory from that of the medieval thinkers. So by equality, Hobbes meant equal ability and the ability of hope of attaining the ends of indi that individuals aspired for. The fiscal weak may achieve this by cunning or stealing what the strong had accomplished through force. Hobbes accepted the differences in fiscal and natural endowments which is given to human beings. Hobbes hereby accepted the differences in physical and natural endowments, but um, he saw human beings as active creatures with a will. 
and that human beings were endowed with both reason and passions. And most of times reason is being passive and passions active. So in essence, passions always superseded reason. The variance in passions created differences in desires and such desire will let one to desire to excel over the other. Since individuals were equal and active, those who succeeded would have more enemies and competitors and face maximum danger. Hobbes observed that human beings stood nothing to gain from the company of others except pain. A permanent rivalry existed between human beings for honor, riches, and authority with the essence of life as nothing but potential warfare. A war of everyone against the other. With this picture painted of the human nature, we can conclude that the human nature is a direct result of chaos, suspicion, self-seeking, appetites, and the quest to survive at all risk and at the risk of others. This directly propels us into the state of nature. The state of nature. Having described the natural person, Hobbes proceeded to portray the state of nature in the bleak and pessimistic human nature being created already. The only rule that individuals acknowledged according to Hobbes was the one which would take if one had the power and retain as long as one could. In this ill condition, in this ill condition, there was no law, no justice, no notion of right and wrong with only force and fraud as the two cardinal virtues in the state of nature. The state of nature prohibited the possibility of ensuring commodious living, a civilized pursuit that made life worthwhile and meaningful. For that matter, permit me to quote him, in such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instrument of moving such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So the principal cause of the conflict or conflict in the state of nature of man, Hobbes did not attribute the predicament of natural person to either sin or depravity, but to human nature itself. The individual, according to him, was the author of his own destruction. The state of nature degenerated into the state of war, a war of every man against every man. Most social life, he tells us, is for gain or for glory. As we have seen, men pay for these pleasures by a host of small pains and humiliation of each other's hands. Substance are but hints of what would have happened if we did not live under a civilized government. So as the conditions in which men lived were of their own making, the conception of a civil society either controlled or suppressed natural instincts, but never changed them. So logically, civil societies were not mere meetings, but bonds that made fit and compact necessary. For Hobbes, it was the absence of fit or trust and not the presence of evil 
quality in man that caused human misery in the natural state. The absence of faith was partly due to limited natural reason according to him and partly due to human inability to differentiate the thoughts and motives of others. Let us now look at natural laws in which some people say it establishes a contradiction in Hobbes' thesis. So, natural laws. In a state of nature, individuals enjoyed complete liberty, including natural rights to everything, even to one another's bodies. So, you are free to do anything that you like. That's what does the natural law. And this natural law he considered to be 19 in number. And permit me to lay emphasis that these laws were not commandments from an omnipotence or laws in which a superior body has made. These laws were counsels of just prudence. It describes the types of civil manners that promote peaceful behavior between one another. Natural laws in Hobbes' theory did not mean eternal justice, perfect morality, or standards to judge existing laws as the Stoics did. They do not imply the existence of a common good, for they merely created the common condition which were necessary for each individual's good. These laws were immutable. Of the 19 of the laws, important emphasis were made between these three. So one, he says, seek peace and follow it. Two, abandon the natural right to things. And the last one, that individual must honor their contracts. Hobbes stressed the fact that peace demanded mutual confidence, for society depended on mutual trust in order to be stable. This led him to conclude that supreme power ought to coincide with supreme authority. In some, governments had to always be backed by force, if not direct, at least implicit. And I beg to quote him again, covenants without source are but words and of no strength to secure a man at all. So this actually evokes hope for the state of nature and thereby sets the pace for us to dig into the social contract. So since, so the social contract so since the first law of nature enjoined or committed individuals to seek peace, then the only way to attain it was through a covenant. And that covenant led to the establishment of a state. Individuals thereby surrendered all their powers through a contract to a third party who interestingly was not a party to the contract, but ironically received all the powers that were surrendered to it. The Commonwealth was constituted when the multitude of individuals were united in one person, when everyone said to the other and placed on their chest, and I quote, I hereby authorize and give up my rights of governing myself to this man as the Leviathan or this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up thy rights to him and authorize all his actions in a like manner. The third party who was the Leviathan or the supreme power was a consequence of the contracts. He came out of the contract and is an artificial person distinct from the natural individual. 
it was not the common war of all. For such an idea did not exist, but was only a substitute for conflicting individual wills. As that would foster and facilitate unity among the multitude within the com common world, the contract created an, artif an artifact, an artificial sovereign authority, whereby each individual gave up his right of gave up his right of governing himself on the condition that others did likewise. They also they also surrendered themselves to this sovereign power. Each individual by consenting to the set rules guaranteed by the basic equality with every other member of the equal pact it applied to. So intuitively it implied that no one possessed more rights than the other. The sovereign must treat all the individuals equally in matters of justice and in levying taxes. Hobbes therefore defined justice as equality in treatment and equality in rights. As part and parcel of the pact, it also enjoined the individual to keep in his promise. For you agree with me that the non-performance would lead to an unequal status. Hobbes thereby equated justice with fairness. Treating others as one would expect to be treated like the golden rule. Once the sovereign power was created, it would be bestow the powers. Permit me to quote him here. This is the generation of that great Leviathan. Or rather, to speak more reverently of that mortal God to which we owe under the immortal God our peace and defense. So this theory, uh, this contract was not a one-sided contract in which we are given to only the Leviathan. The Leviathan also had his or her part to play in the contract. So as individuals, as we enter into contract, we just we just don't enter into contract and do not expect a benefit from that contract. So imagine that you just saw a girl one day and you've uh, proposed love to him or uh, to her and the contract that she's signing to you is that every day she'll come to you for money, she'll you'll be a uh, burden, but there are certain privileges she, will, she wouldn't allow you into. Then, rationally speaking, you wouldn't enter into such a contract. You adversely or you, at that time, withdraw from that contract. So, the Leviathan had a responsibility to the people. And the people also had a responsibility to the Leviathan by giving them or giving to the Leviathan their rights of ruling them own self. So the contract created a civil society and political authority for it was social for it was a social and political contract. Emphasis should be placed on the above mentioned. Or you will appreciate it when we look at Locke. Not to digress, this was a contract of each other with the other. According to him, a common world can be established by two methods. One, acquisition. And two, institution. By acquisition, when individuals were threatened into submission, so acquisition will, will make you submit that's the forceful part and the institution process of it was when individuals of their own impulse or intuition united agreeing to transfer all their natural powers through a contract to a third party of one few or many of one few or many both were contractual 
though the process of institution exemplified the essence of contractualism so the second part that's the institution stage that's what that is the voluntary giving out of your rights so that's more contractual than what than acquisition where in acquisition you'll be forced or threatened to to submit to to the sovereign power and the contract was perpetual and irrevocable irrevocable so immediately we entered into it there is no going back so hope saw the sovereign power as undivided unlimited inalienable and permanent the contract created the state and the government concurrently the sovereign power was authorized to enact laws as a deem fit and as such laws were legitimate were legitimate and in categorical terms the powers and authority of the sovereign was to be defined with least ambiguity the following are the major attributes of the uh, the Hobbesian sovereign that's the levian time so the levian time is not that kind of a ruler who is a soft guy in which you can uh, rub your shoulders about with him or he, this guy is not he's not a nice guy he is going to, to enforce the laws to the latter because Hobbes did not ascribe human or such passions as he mentioned earlier to him that guy is not just a nice guy he's like this guy or that guy there are no nonsense people so these were some of the attributes or um, duties or powers in which the leviathan possessed so when the sovereign or the leviathan is absolute and unlimited and accordingly no conditions implicit or explicit can be put, imposed on it it is not limited either by rights of the subjects or by customary and statutory laws so this this guy is just an, an all-powerful mortal guy under the auspices of the immortal god two the sovereign is not a party to the covenant or the contract so the sovereign or the leviathan does not exist did not exist prior to the commencement or the beginning of the contract so he was not there in which the contract were what was signed he was just given what he was just given maybe a contract to come and serve and contract was signed between men in the state of nature mainly to escape from a state of war of every man against every man and the contract was irrevocable there is nothing that you can do about the contract so far as you guys have entered into the contract that establishes it three the newly created sovereign can do no injury to his subjects because he is their authorized agent his action cannot be illegal because he himself is the sole source and the interpreter of laws so this new guy or this um, leviathan as i mentioned earlier is not a nice guy but as he's not a, a nice guy he doesn't have any right to what, to deliberately hurt citizens or beat them up but he was what he was the law himself everything that he said was law another power too was that no one had the right to come and complain to the leviathan that maybe his actions were wrong or his actions were right in, in any sense you don't have anyone you don't have any right to go and complain it's like in some years past in one of um, the presidents had his vice president beaten up because he questioned the authority of the president and this vice president ironically rushed to the 
Nima police station to lodge a complaint to the police, but it didn't end anywhere. Five, the sovereign also had absolute right to declare war and peace or make peace, to levy taxes and to impose penalties. Six, the sovereign is the ultimate source of all administrative, legislative, and judicial authority. According to Hobbes, law, the law is the command of the sovereign. So the sovereign was three in one institution. The Leviathan also had the responsibility to protect the people externally and internally for peace and preservation were the basis of the creation of the sovereign or the Leviathan. Thus, Hobbes' sovereign represents the ultimate, supreme, and single authority in the state, and there is no right for resistance against him except in the case of self-defense. I hereby conclude that the Leviathan Hobbes has been recognized as one of the masterpieces of political theory, known for its style, clarity, and its open exposition. It laid down a systematic theory of sovereignty, law, human nature, and political obligation. The way to overcome this ethical disagreement was by acknowledging that each was justified in, defend in defending oneself and that others could be harmed on the grounds of self-defense and self-preservation was a fundamental right of nature and equally a, bit, and equally a basic law. Hobbes argued that the state was established for human convenience and obeyed on the grounds of expediency. It was obeyed in most cases since obedience was more agreeable than disobedience. It was a product of human reason and hence reason not authority had to be the arbiter or the arbitrator in politics. He emphasized that sovereign power would define divine, natural or fundamental law since it was the basis for establishing disagreement between people. So Hobbes created an all-powerful state, but it was no a totalitarian monster as some of you might think. It's hard to guarantee peace, order, and security, and was not interested in self-glorification. So congratulations upon finishing up the whole tutorial session. I hope you enjoyed every bit of it. If you have questions, kindly hit me or hit them below the comment section. I wait your appetite for the next video tutorial, which will be on our next contractualist, that's John Locke, with your most loyal and service-oriented peer tutor, Kundi Shabrak Bana. Thanks very much and keep safe from the virus. The world needs you alive to contribute your service to its progress. Best regards.